We move now to the introduction. Dr. Gemma Robinson is a senior lecturer in English studies at the University of Stirling and editor of the University of Hungary, the collected poems and selected prose of Martin Carter, published in 2006. She has kindly agreed to provide a short introduction. Over to you, Dr. Robinson. Thanks. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, I just wanted to say quickly how grateful I am for being invited to this event, but also to say how grateful I am to Martin and Phyllis Carter that 25-ish years ago, they let me into their lives when I got a grant to go to, um, to visit Guyana to, to interview them. And it's really great to be one voice in a wider web of people who are sustained by Carter's work. And I know that there are many people in the audience tonight who know Carter's story a lot better than I ever will. I think over the years, one of the things I've been learning is about how his poetry circulated in Guyana and also how it has very interesting global lives as well. And for me, Carter's work is always moving between resistance, which is the theme for tonight, and affinity. And as you'll know, those words come from his first and last collections, poems of resistance and poems of affinity. How do we work against the worlds, the kinds of thinking that we don't support, and how do we create or how do we see the affinities that will help us build the worlds that we want to? I'm going to share my screen. I hope Isabel asked me to introduce poems of resistance and what I want to do, if this works. Well done. Uh, yeah, I think that should be okay. What I want to do is to just take 10 minutes to track some of these twinned interests between resistance and affinity through the multiple versions of poems of resistance that exist. In the 1950s, there were five different versions of poems of resistance, and it was republished again in Guyana in the 1960s and the 1970s. So throughout, I'm going to call him Carter. I hope that's okay. I know to many of you, he is Martin and, and other names, but um, I wanted to start here with the cover of Poems of Resistance from British Guyana. I think it's a good place to start for thinking about the context of 1953 and beyond. And this is the front cover artwork used by Lawrence and Wishart. And I think it positions us very definitely in relation to resistance. And one of the things I've been wondering is about how readers might have viewed this image at the time. And I think that would depend on how well they knew Carter and the crisis that was taking place in Guyana. You'll see the prominent central figure with his raised fist turned towards the ships. And I think for some people that might have reminded them of the urgent news that British warships had entered Guyanese waters, that the constitution had been suspended and that there was a state of emergency. I think for some people, it might have registered that Carter, a Georgetown based poet, was extending his poetic voice to the workers whose lives he hadn't lived that he was imagining a world beyond his life experience to the African, Indian, Afro-Guyanese, Indo-Guyanese workers who lived on the plantations in the past and in the present. I think for others, the covers might probably have seemed like a portrait of the poet. What I think is contained in this image is a snapshot of 20th century resistant Guyana in the wider Caribbean. I think it sits between something documentary and something imaginative or transformative. And I guess I'm thinking here about the, um, the green swirling colors that challenge the realism of the moment that's also being depicted. So this is an image, not just about 1954 or 1953. I think it's pointing us back to the plantation histories of an enslaved, indentured and proletarianized sugar cultivation. And this legacy, I think, of colonialism and enslavement is ever present in Carter's work. And just to, um, to get us thinking about some of his later poetry, I took a quotation from Confound Deliberate Chaos from 1974, where he writes, from the plantation earth, I cry. What I want to do is think about the year of 1953. It was, I think, a year 
of great change for Martin Carter. In January, he married Phyllis Howard. He also resigned from the civil service in order to stand for the New Amsterdam seat in the first universal suffrage elections in 1953. And as many of you will know, he didn't win his seat, but the PPP went on to win a landslide victory. In the manifesto for the PPP, there's a summary of party candidates and Carter is described in there as being an ex-civil servant and he is now, quote, simply a writer. Not simply, of course. The announcement, though, I think is quite low key and it's surrounded by other descriptions of the candidates who are described as being farmers, sugar workers, stall holders, agriculturalists, union leaders. And I think that this kind of comradeship across roles was really important as a focus and aim for the PPP. If we continue to think about 1953, if we carry on in August, he attended the World Festival of Youth and Students that was held in Bucharest, Romania. And there he represented the Guyanese Peace Committee. While traveling back to Guyana through Trinidad, he was deemed an undesirable visitor, a quote, undesirable visitor, and was ordered to leave the country. If we're thinking about expressions of resistance and affinity, I think that this festival is important for us to remember. Its motto for that year was, no, our generation will not serve death and destruction. If we keep moving through 1953, in August, 30,000 workers went on strike and Thunder, the journal of the PPP, ran a headline that said, glorious struggle of Guyana's working class. And as we know, not everyone saw it this way. The governor in British Guy what was then British Guyana, Alfred Savage called a state of emergency, but solidarity was being expressed across the region. This headline is from the Journal of the Caribbean Labour Congress, the journal Caribbean News, hands off Guyana, they write, and they were quick to express their affinity with Guyanese anti-colonial activism. Towards the end of October, PPP supporters met at Atkinson Field and Burnham and Jagan were heading off on a tour to the UK and India to campaign for support. Now, there aren't many pictures or footage of Martin Carter that I've seen from the 1950s, but in the background of, um, of this shot, I think you'll see Martin Carter there. They sang the socialist song, Red, um, The Red Flag, and then as a group of supporters, they waved off Jagan and Burnham on their tour. A week later, Martin Carter would be back at Atkinson Field, this time though detained without charge for his PPP activities. And Carter remained active while imprisoned. In one letter of resistance, he wrote, I'm compelled, and this is on the slide, I'm compelled to challenge the authority that keeps me detained in a hut with a garden of rusting barbed wire. And there was a clear aim, um, sorry, there was a clear claim here about who should be voicing Guyana's future. In a much later interview, Carter remembered some other things about his time as a detainee. He said, well, we could stay together and discuss things. And my wife was allowed to see me and I was allowed to write. I think when I was speaking to her, Phyllis had slightly different memories of that. She said that initially she couldn't find out what had happened to Carter at all. And then when she did, she was having to make the very long journey then to Atkinson Field to visit him. Phyllis and Janet Jagan were also arranging to publish some poems of Carter's at this time. And I think it was this version, and apologies for the the grainy reproduction here. But what you can see in front of you are six poems that were anonymous at this moment. They were seized by the police from the magnet printery in Georgetown shortly after Carter was arrested in October 1953. And they were sent to the colonial office in London for investigation. So I think one of the things we may be 
want to keep on remembering is that the publication of these poems was taking place at a time when PPP literature was being seized and books were being confiscated from the homes of PPP members. So there were real risks involved for Phyllis and others in getting involved in the publishing of poems. We can continue to think about other versions of poems of resistance as well. In this same period towards the end of 1953, the same six poems from, um, from the Magnet Printery were published in a left-wing journal from the USA, Masses and Mainstream. And I think these were sent by Janet Jagan, who was always a champion of Carter's work to be published while he was imprisoned. And there are more in the, um, in the National Library in Georgetown, there is a single sheet of paper with three poems on it titled Poems of Resistance, which is the image you're seeing on your left. And then on your right, you're seeing another version of Poems of Resistance. I sing my song of freedom. This was published by the Education Department of the West Indian Independence Party of Trinidad. And it's now held in the New Beacon Archives in London. It includes, and again, you might be able to pick out some of this on your screen, it includes as a forward a long quotation from Thomas Paine, encouraging resistance and revolution in 18th century America. These are the times that try men's souls. So by the time Lawrence and Wishart, which was the publishing arm of the British Communist Party, published its poems of resistance from British Guyana, Carter's urgent political poems were making their way around the world in lots of different ways. And I think what's interesting or what's interesting to me about these publications of largely the same poems, the 1954 um, edition is an expanded version of Poems of Resistance. I think what's interesting about it is the kind of map that it creates. It is a map, I think, of resistance and affinity. And I hope I'm not overstating it too much by thinking if we can map those places of public release, then we're also starting to see a connected map of anti-colonialism, one which travels within Guyana, from Guyana to the USA, to Trinidad, to the colonial office in the UK, to the supporters of the Communist Party. In one of the poems that appears in the um, the collection, I clench my fist. Carter ends that poem with these words. Although you point your gun straight at my head, I clench my fist above my head. I sing my song of freedom. And Carter doesn't just write about singing a song of freedom. His poem is that song. And song then takes on a renewed sense of meaning, I think, reminding us of oral traditions of protest and helping us recognize the way that poems circulate and circulate in ways that maybe we've not considered. The West Indian Independence Party, for example, held demonstrations in Woodford Square in Port of Spain when the emergency was announced. And John LaRose remembers reciting Carter's work during the 50s. So Poems of Resistance is not just one text, it's not just one moment. And we certainly shouldn't be prioritizing a London published edition of Carter's work that was published just during the emergency, but a year after some of those dangerous first months. Instead, I think what we can do is situate that alongside different forms of anti-colonial literature that's emerging in multiple ways, in different ways and in relation to different kinds of anti-colonial practices. I know that this evening we're going to move on to a reading of University of Hunger by Varney. And I just wanted to end by returning to the newspaper, Caribbean News. On page three, without any comment, there is a poem titled, Is the University of Hunger the Wide Waste? And I think that this is the first time that this poem was published. And I say that partly because I think that he, Carter's still playing around with the title of the poem. There's some movement in the stanzas, some differences between capitalizations. At around the same time, this poem was published in Kaikovara, the Guyanese journal. And I've always thought about it in terms of a Guyanese readership. 
and Fred Degar has described the poem as being a trek through the country of Guyana. And it is definitely that. But now I'm also thinking about other places. The leading story in the issue that this poem appeared in was the one that talked about the World Youth Festival in Bucharest that Carter had attended. So perhaps this is a poem that was written in part or read in Romania in the context of the Youth Festival and with its explicit message of international peace and friendship. So perhaps we can add Romania to our growing map of Carter's poetry of resistance and affinity. And I'll end there if that's okay with everyone. <laughs>